and stay. If it starts to wriggle and walk off, we'll have to do something about it. Um, but I bet you'd like to know what's under there, wouldn't you? The thing is, you're going to have to endure a, a, a sermon to find out. Turn with you, if you will, to the book of Hebrews. Hebrews uh, chapter 10. The writer's been writing to, to, these, to these people and they're undergoing a lot of persecution. And uh, it's, it's, a, it's been really hard for them. Some are actually thriving in their faith, and we'll see that. But others are actually uh, uh, being tempted to give up, to throw away um, uh, Christianity, to give up on Jesus, and to, to walk away uh, from the faith. Now... We may, not be, we may not suffer the same sort of persecution as what these people are going through. We may not be tempted to uh, reject uh, de- Jesus. But one thing we may, we may be in danger of is uh, settling into a passive, non-effective form of Christianity uh, uh, because it's easy to hide in the shadows sometimes in the face of persecution at work or, or just being too serious about the faith. And what the writer is going to do in our passage tonight He's going to answer this question for us is, what's the remedy for a heart in danger of failing? What's the remedy for a heart in danger of failing? And what the, what the writer's already done up to chapter 10 that we've seen is he's, he's created a case for Jesus. If you want to remember the first 10 chapters of the book of Hebrews, it's Jesus is better. We won't go over it again tonight, but Jesus is better. Sacrifice is a better uh, system of faith, he's a better prophet, he's a better message, etc., etc. You can go through that and trace it through. But Jesus is actually better than what the world offers. And then what he does is he stops three or four times throughout the book and pleads for people to look to Jesus, to cling to Jesus, to hold on to him, to draw near to him. And not just for yourself, but for others. Encourage others to do the same as well. And there's a sense of urgency in this because the day of the Lord is, is near. When Christ returns, there's not going to be a second opportunity to uh, run to Jesus. And so we're at the last warning passage and in Hebrews, which some people say is the most serious and sometimes the most difficult uh, to understand. So let's, let's read verses 23. We'll start in verses 23 and we'll read through to verses 31. And let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful to that promise. Verse 24, And let us consider one another how to provoke unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much the more. So do this more as you see the day approaching. And he gives a reason why it's important to do this. He says, For if we sin willfully after that we've received the knowledge of the truth, there remains no more sacrifice for sins. But a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation which shall devour the adversaries. He that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses. Do you think they got into trouble? How much more do you think people are going to get into trouble or the punishment will be um, thought worthy if you tr- uh, have trodden underfoot the Son of God and have counted the blood of the covenant by which you are sanctified an unholy thing and you've done all this um, uh, just to outrage the spirit of grace for we know him that said vengeance belongs unto me I will recompense since the Lord and again the Lord shall judge his people it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. There's some serious words there and some quite difficult ones for us to uh, think through. But what the writer is essentially saying is the reason why we hold fast our faith, the reason why we meet together to encourage each other and consider how to stir one another up to love and to good works as the day approaches is because of this. If we drift into deliberate neglect and permanent rejection of God, uh, judgment and, and eternal punishment, await. 
it's quite serious. There isn't mercy for the one who rejects God. There is no mercy. There wasn't in the Old Testament and there still isn't today. Notice the description of them. They trample underfoot Jesus. They profane the blood blessings that they've experienced and they outrage the spirit of grace. Now, who this person is, I understand that there are different opinions and I don't want to get caught up too much in, into that. But my understanding is that this person probably comes to church or this person has probably came, come to church at some point, maybe left, and by the very grace of God, they've experienced the privilege of coming before God with the congregation of God's people. They've probably externally experienced some change in his life for the better, although not internally transformed. And the reason why this is such a difficult passage is some people get tripped up by the word in, in verses uh, 29 where it says, um, uh, whereby he was sanctified. Again, I don't want to get too technical on this. I just want to try and look at the big idea. But I, think, I, did, I have had one person specifically ask me, what does that mean? So I think it's going to be worthwhile just having a quick uh, look at that. Just because the Bible says someone's sanctified, it doesn't necessarily mean that they're saved. And we can, there, are, there are plenty of scriptures I can take. There's a couple in Hebrews where he used the sanctification of things or people that weren't saved. But probably the clearest is 1 Corinthians 7. So just turn there quickly. I think this will be helpful. I'll try not to get bogged down. 1 Corinthians 7, uh, verses 13. And the woman which has a husband that believeth not, and if he be pleased, talking about relationships here, and if he be pleased to dwell with her, let her not leave him. For the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife, and the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband. Elsewhere your children are unclean, but now uh, they're holy. And it's not talking about being saved here because of verse 16. He says, For what do you know, O wife, whether you might save your husband? Or how do you know, O man, whether you might save your uh, wife? Very different usage of the language here. What he's saying is that in this relationship that having an unsaved person with a saved person can bring some positive moral influence to bear on them. It can bring some positive moral influence to bear on them. It doesn't necessarily save them, but it puts them in that uh, a great position by which they can be affected and ministered to by uh, the Spirit. I don't know if that's clear. Um, probably one, one last helpful one. Let's just, just turn to Hebrews chapter 6, because this is actually in Hebrews, and it might be helpful for us to see. We've looked at this. This is another warning passage. But Hebrews chapter 6, and uh, let's start 4 to 8, 4 to 8. He says, For it's impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and been made partakers of the Holy Ghost, we see a bit of this language again, and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come, if they shall fall away to renew them again unto repentance, seeing they crucify to themselves the Son of God afresh, and put him to an open shame. Um, for the earth which drinks in the rain, that comes. what he's going to do is he's, he's going to give an agricultural description of this. He says, For the earth which drinks in the rain and comes oft upon it, brings forth herbs, meat for them by which it is dressed. If it does this, they receive a blessing from God. But if they don't, but, it, but that which beareth thorns and briars is rejected and is nigh unto cursing, whose end is uh, to be burned. What, he's, what, what the writer of Hebrews is saying here is that rain falls on the just and the unjust. You can see that, right? Rain falls on the just and the unjust without exception. The fact that it's received the rain or it's received blessings by God isn't the issue. But what is produced with the rain is the issue. You can see that. Not, not whether you've received blessings from God. Isn't the, that's not the issue. The issue is... What have you produced with the rain uh, once it's hit is the issue. Because then what he does in verses 6 in 9 to 10, 
he's going to draw a comparison between uh, what these people have experienced. Just have a quick look. But beloved, we're persuaded of better things of you and things that actually accompany salvation, thus we speak. For God's not unjust to forget your work and labour of love, which you have showed towards his name, so love towards God, and in that you've ministered to the saints and do minister. There's something better. There's something better than banking on these experiences, and it's namely present love for God and love for one another. The more sure and better evidence of salvation is this. I hope that wasn't too technical, but I felt the need to, to cover that. The, big, the, the, the issue in chapter 11 and what we just looked at is this. The warning is this. If you let yourself drift into willful rejection of God, despite everything you've graciously experienced, you'll come under judgment from God and prove that you are not those of faith that preserve their souls or believe to the saving of the souls. And we see that right at the end of chapter 10, where it says, but we're not of them who draw back unto perdition, but of them that believe to the saving of the soul. I know this is quite hard, hard words. You don't lose your salvation. We don't, we hold that. That doesn't happen. But people that are faith and that a work that when God starts a work in you, He actually does complete it. We're not sure what that look what that look like. Sometimes you need micros- microscopes to see the fruit. But but God does a work in that person and He will complete it. Um, but a person that falls into willful rejection of God, uh, and even though they've received the rain, but isn't producing uh, what they should. You can look at other texts. Matthew talks about this as well, um, about the, the seed when it falls on different ground, gr- grounds. The reason I'm stressing this is it's quite, it, this is it's heavy. It's very heavy, and it can be quite sensitive. This is serious for all of us because the writer of Hebrews, he's, he's giving this letter to the church at that time. He doesn't know who, who is saved and who isn't saved. Um, he doesn't know that. I don't know that. Um, but the warning... Is, is there. What does the writer do to remedy a heart in danger of drifting? Because this is the point for us. What does the writer do to remedy a heart in danger of drifting? And I don't think we'll get too much more technical now, so we'll just we'll push on and we're, we're not far from being done. So what does the writer do to remedy a heart in danger of drifting? He draws on the path for inspiration and encouragement and a reminder They had fruit of salvation. Have a look at verses 32 to 34. But call to remembrance the former days in which after you were illuminated, you endured a great fight of afflictions, partly whilst you were made a gazing stock or you were put on display both by the reproaches and afflictions and partly whilst you you became companions of them that were so used. For you had compassion of me in my bonds and took joyfully the spoiling of your goods, knowing in yourselves that you have in heaven a better and an enduring substance. He says, remember you had hard times and you persevered before. You won the victory. You kept your eye on the prize, namely your eternal heavenly home and coming Christ. It wasn't, and you can, you can see by the description of these people, it wasn't just a grim and bear it till it's over. As she flourished and grew in maturity and love. But they joyfully accepted the plundering of what they had. Why did they joyfully accept the plundering of what they had? Have a look again. I want you to notice in verses, um, mid part of verses 34, the word knowing. Again, I'm sorry, I didn't want to get technical here, but the word that that's linked to is in verses 32, which says, You endured a great fight of afflictions. Why? knowing in yourselves that you have in heaven a better and an enduring substance. They knew that in comparison to what they had now, uh, what they're going to have is, is not only going to be better, but it's going to last forever, a better and a lasting substance. You know, what you have here on earth is, is temporary. The house you live in, the job you have, the health you have, uh, the physical family that you have, including your marriage partner, uh, none of it's going to last. But we're so inclined to preserve to it and cling to it, aren't we? We're so, 
many of us would probably uh, die for it. We haven't got a glimpse of what we have in store. John Newton shared this, shared this story. And he says there's a, there's a story about a man who uh, he's going to this city and he's going to inherit millions of dollars. He's going to own all the land he could ever dream of. He'll have everything he ever needs. All he has to do is get there and claim it. So the man packs up everything into his car and he starts the journey. He's happy, he's joyful, he's singing. And as he's he's approaching the city, he's only about a kilometre away. You can see the city and you can almost touch touch the gates and uh, the car gets a flat tyre with all his belongings in it. And the man, instead of jumping out and saying, I can run the rest of the way, the man gets grumpy, kicks the tyre, uh, moans, why me? Why now? I'm so close. This is the last thing I want. I get a stupid flat tyre to go home and get it repaired. The person who truly has a heart and focus on what is in store for him and gets the flat tyre would be like, I don't need the car with all the stuff in it. I'll run the rest of the way. I'll even limp if I have to. The person is just overwhelmed and excited uh, for what's in store. Nothing can stop him. Nothing can actually get him down. This is a picture of our life and how easy it can be to lose perspective of what's important and what's going to pale in insignificance to what we're going to have in eternity. Isn't it? So what he does here for these people, he reminds them of the past. Uh, their lives were transformed by this alternative perspective, a, health, a heavenly perspective. After he reminds them of the past, he's going to jump to the charge. So what, what should we do? This is uh, 35 to 37. He starts with therefore. On the basis of this, don't cast away your confidence, which has great recompense of reward. For you have need of patience or endurance, that after you've done the will of God, you might receive the promise. For yet a little while, uh, for you in a little while, and he that shall come will come and will not tarry. He says, um, don't give up. There's a great reward for those who endure and have patience. And what's the patient reward for these people? It's in verses uh, uh, 37. In a little while that Christ is coming and all the promises that he uh, promised to you is going to come true and you will receive them. Verses 38 to 39, he says, Now the just shall live by faith, but if any man draw back, my soul has no pleasure in him. But we're not of them who draw back unto perdition or draw back to destruction, but of them that believe to the saving of the soul. We're not those people. Righteous people live by faith and don't give up. They don't draw back. They don't shrink back to an end of only destruction. They, through faith, preserve their souls or believe to the saving of the soul. So what's the remedy for a drifting heart? The remedy for a drifting heart is a constant looking forward to the promises we have in Christ. The remedy for a drifting heart is a constant looking forward to the promises we have in Christ. The only thing that's going to stop you and I from turning away to something else that seems better is if you can actually see Jesus for who he is and what he offers. The warning specifically for these people was that there were some in the church that were prepared to give up on Jesus. And the plea is, don't do that. Fight for faith. Look to Jesus. What Jesus has in store for you is so much better. If you're saved here, let this be a challenge and an encouragement for you. So what's this going to look like in our life? And I find this is the hardest part of the part of a sermon. Is what 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 would this actually look like for us? Because again, our danger, if we're saved here today, our danger isn't falling away from Christ. We can be rest assured of that. But the danger here is settling back into a lifestyle that that um uh is non-productive and is passive. And we're in danger of, of that. So what's this, what's this going to actually look like? 
Have a look in verses 34. It gives us a bit of a challenge here. He's, these, these particular people, they had lives that were absolutely changed remarkably. But they knew something. Um, for you had compassion of me in my bonds and you took fully the spoiling, you took joyfully the spoiling of your gods, knowing in yourselves that you had a heaven, so you had in heaven a better and enduring substance. They knew something that was life-changing, but they needed reminding of that. Um, you see that in verses 32, but call to remembrance. So specifically for these people, it was the second coming of Jesus in a home in heaven. Maybe that's what you need here tonight. Maybe you need to remember that, that you have a home in heaven, and that God's going to come again and take you to himself. I can't wait till we get to chapter 11. And I know um, Rob touched on it a little bit. But what, but what we're going to see in Romans chapter 11, and I'm not going to preach it tonight, but we're going to see that you know, countless times he gives us example after example after example after example of people who are able to, through faith, apply something about the promises of God uh, and who he was to them and their individual lives. And what that did was it empowers, empowered them continue on uh, like Abraham who could offer up his son because he trusted in the promise of great great grandchildren he knew that God could raise the dead if he had to to bring that to happen and he applied that to his life and it I mean I just can't fathom doing that to one of your children but it was empowering enough that it did that um, and we'll see other cases as well and when we get to chapter 12 we'll see Jesus himself who endured the cross for the joy that was set before him. Something that he was looking to enabled him to endure the cross. So what's this, what's this going to look like? Again, I, this is what I really struggle with, but it's going to be somehow us as a church grabbing something relevant for you, personalising it and applying it, something true about Jesus. Um, as a family, maybe you, you might create a refocus moment, maybe after the meal, or uh, some particular way you might, you might now sit down and let's just talk about God, you know. Who is he? You know, his faithfulness. Uh, talk about um, the things that he actually promises uh, for, for you. Maybe, maybe it might be uh, scheduling a catch-up for a chat with someone. Spend some time thinking about who God is and about his promises. Because it's encouraging. It's encouraging and it revitalizes us. We need, remem- we need to be reminded of, of this. If we want to endure and thrive in this Christian life, we must be people who are learning how to draw upon the promises of God, both present and future, and apply them to our lives. If we want to endure and thrive in this Christian and again, remember that the writer of Hebrews is writing to an audience. He doesn't know if you're saved or you're not saved. This is the seriousness of it. But we must be people who can draw upon the promises of God, both present promises and the future promises, and apply them to our lives. Um, I don't really know. I'm not real good at, at doing that yet. Susanna and I, are, I've had a sickness for the last uh, sort of couple of months, and it's got me down, up and down, and, and stuff. And I haven't probably done this well enough because I occasionally get down and down in the dumps about it all. Um, this is where you know, we need to be able to speak into each other's lives truth. Now back to this. Um, did the uh, expectation of what's under this uh, blanket help you endure the suffering of sitting through this, <laughs> this sermon? Um, the point is this. Um, I'm not, I may not show you what's under there, but <laughs> the point is this. <laughs> the point is this. Looking forward to something helps you endure and often thrive in what you're doing. The spiritual point is this. The Christian life can be tough. We know it can be tough. There's ups and downs. Um, there's suffering. There's, there's all sorts of trials. The Christian life can be tough. But we should be reminding ourselves and others of what promises we have in store for us. We should be able to look forward to something. So how are you doing in this? 
Are you creating those moments in your day where your eyes are lifted upwards and you're reorientated to the goal and end point of Christianity? How well are you doing in this? We need, we need reminding because we're prone to forget. We need reminding because we're prone to forget. At one point in your life, you might find someone in a point of need that needs refocusing. Can you do that? And as a church, can we, are, we, are we comfortable enough to rely on each other to do that, to refocus us? Can we do that as a church? Um, look out for people in need and even rely on others to be able to refocus us, to be able to push, push on towards the prize, as Paul says in Philippians. What's the remedy for a drifting heart? Remedy for the drifting heart is a constant looking forward to the promises we have in Christ. The remedy for a drifting heart is a constant looking forward to the promises we have in Christ. Now let's pray. <clears throat> Dear God, we're thankful for your word. Uh, God, there are many things in it that we don't understand. There are many hard sayings, as it were. Um, the writer of Hebrews was dealing with, with people that were sitting under the ministry and, and supposedly thriving. They may have been like Judas who um, cast, did, did wonderful works, um, who hung around Jesus, but then in the end rejected rejected you and, and um, was, is called the son of perdition. Uh, God, we don't know who's in this church, but we do encourage and, and God, I, I pray that the word here, and it wasn't me, but the word here encouraged people, don't, don't do that to your life. Keep looking to Jesus, looking to Jesus, the author and finisher of your faith. Keep your eye on the goal, keep your eye on the prize. God, I pray that for us that are Christians here and we're tempted to be discouraged. Maybe we're tempted just to uh, just sit back and just, just um, incognito get through, get through life in the workforce without standing up for Jesus. Um, may we be encouraged to, uh, to focus on the promises that you have for us, to be able to be like these people who could joyfully accept the plundering of their property and be put in prison because they knew that they were going to get something better, something that was going to last. God, I pray that we can somehow be a church that, as he says in chapter 10, encourage one another daily. Um, in chapter 3, encourage one another uh, daily while it's called today, lest any be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. Or in 1 Thessalonians, where in 5, where he says... Uh, we're not appointed to wrath but to earn salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. Whether we live or whether we die, we shall be with him. Therefore, encourage one another in these words. God, can we be people that can lift our eyes up from the, the hard stuff and lift our eyes up to that which is good, namely Jesus Christ and seeing him and becoming like him. God, may we be a church that can look out for the needs of others and do that for, our, for, e for each other. I pray for this in your name. Amen.